Great. So welcome, everyone. Please just keep tapping in your, uh, your, uh, your name and where you're from into the little chat box. I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight to um, our talk by Mihai Moiciano in celebration of um, our flow theme for the Sterling Photography Festival. For those of you who are not in uh, the UK, we're actually broadcasting from Stirling in central Scotland. Um, and we're delighted to have Mihai join us tonight from Brasov in Romania. So um, just a very brief introduction. Um, Mihai and I first met uh, back in 2010 when I lived in uh, Romania. And uh, when I first arrived there, um, I worked with um, a number of other uh, women um, on a photography project that became known as Romania through the lenses of expatriate women. And what we did was we worked uh, with photographers in Romania to help us learn the skills, but also to help us learn the culture and to get to know the people and the places of that beautiful country. Um, so I was living in Bucharest at the time and I'd heard of this uh, photographer, uh, Mihai Moiciano, who uh, worked uh, and lived in Brasov. And I took the opportunity to seek him out um, when I visited uh, the, the Transylvanian mountains. And so Mihai and I first met in a little place called Magura, uh, not far from Brasov. And he was actually running a photography uh, tour the weekend that I met him. So I was delighted to bump into him and delighted even more so when he said he would like to run a workshop with my, with my friends and I. So Mihai is um, a photographer and a filmmaker. Um, I do believe, Mihai, you started your career as a filmmaker. And I think you'll see from the images that Mihai shares with us tonight that his photographs really do tell a story. So that filmmaking talent shines through in his still photography as well. Our theme for this year uh, is flow, which is a nod to um, Scotland's year of coasts and waterways, um, but also a nod to the passage of time and the strange year that we've had over the last, the last year or so, and that one year has just sort of flowed into the next. So when I spoke with Mihai um, earlier on this year and put the theme to him, he was delighted to join us. And of course, it made sense for him to talk about the fantastic Danube Delta. I know Mikhail is going to share a few other things with us tonight, but without further ado, I would just like to hand you across to Mikhail and allow him to start his presentation. Thank you, Mikhail. Hello, good evening to everybody. Here in Romania, it's already dark. I see that in Scotland, it's uh, still uh, light. So, uh, uh jenny make me uh, an introduction uh, yes I, I i work as a professional photographer here in romania is also a professional filmmaker i do make uh, documentaries mainly and um, uh, sometimes adventure films but um, and i work uh, for a while in a, a tv station like eight years in the past now, and then I uh, come back and work as a professional photographer. And since five years ago, I come back to the filmmaking because, you know, the, uh, the technique and uh, all the capabilities of the new cameras are very, very good. And I think, okay, it's time to come back to the, to the film and uh, make more films because I like to, to tell stories. This is the fact that uh, making a film is like, it's telling a story. So since I like telling stories, I, um, I start making film again. And uh, I make also film and photography uh, in, the, in the same time. So that's brief, my, uh, uh, my info about me. And maybe we can uh, start uh, my presentation uh, with, uh, do, do I have a, a share screen right now or not? Do you see yes, my... you do, Mihai. ready to share when you are. Okay. I'm ready, share. 
Okay, so you can uh, see my my screen. Okay, first of all, uh, maybe not everybody of every, any one of you knows where Romania is. So, as you can see, Romania is an eastern part of uh, Europe. Uh, it's not a middle. It's a middle-sized country. It's not a big one. Not a small one. It's like uh, ninety-two thousand uh, square miles. Since uh, Scotland has thirty, I suppose it's uh, like three times larger than than Scotland, and has a population of nineteen million people. So. Um, what is important for Romania, here is, this is uh, the map of Romania. I live right here in the middle of the country. It's an area, very nice area, but what we are talking now, we are talking about this part of the country, which is the Danube Delta. And I must tell you that the Danube Delta is the mouth through which the Danube River goes to the Black Sea. The Danube River is the second longer, longest uh, river in Europe. Um, it uh, springs in uh, Germany, in the mountains or Black Forest Mountains in Germany and uh, goes to the east towards Black Sea. It's like 2,500 uh, kilometers long and the second longest after Volga in Russia. And also the Danube Delta, uh, but first of all, uh, soon after the Danube come uh, to our country, it goes through the southern border, the border with Serbia and Bulgaria. And uh, at, at the entrance, the Danube go through uh, uh, a range of mountains, which um, uh, in, in which the Danube carved a very nice gorge, which is uh, the um, I don't know the name the name of the gorge is translated in in, in English, but uh, let me see. Um, many people uh, name them uh, like uh, Golden uh, Iron Gates. Well, it's not quite the Iron Gates Gorges, but okay, this is the general name that people knows about this area. And you, as you can see on the right side is uh, the Serbian border and the left side is Romanian land. So uh, what you can see is uh, it's a, a lake made by a dam built um, uh, at the exit of the river from these gorges and the tail of the lake goes to Belgrade. It's a huge lake and the level of the water has raised with, I suppose, 80 meters after the construction of the dam. It's a very nice and interesting area, this. It's a very picturesque. A lot of people go and uh, sail through these gorges. There are caves, there are nice uh, uh, paths through the mountains and the nice view as you can see. Now we are talking about Danube Delta. The Danube Delta is uh, the Delta that Danube uh, made it when uh, meets the Black Sea. And it has uh, three channels. The Northern one uh, is Kilia, the middle one is uh, Sulina and the Southern one is uh, St. George channel. Well, in between, there are a lot, a lot of small channels uh, that you can navigate through small boats and um, a lot of lakes that uh, um, are populated with a lot, a lot, a lot of wild birds. Mainly uh, birds you can find in, in, uh, as a wildlife in uh, Danube Delta. This is why I will, uh, this is a general image from the uh, aerial. It's an aerial image of uh, the Danube Delta. Uh, this is, uh, those are the small channels that we navigate with the small boats in order to find birds and take photography and uh, so on. And I will uh, show you, that this video has no sound. I cannot uh, 
see the sound, uh, send you the sound. But what I want to tell you is that early in the morning, we are leaving uh, the village, uh, Fisherman Village, that is in the middle of the Danube Delta on a small channel. And we navigate with very slow speed in order not to disturb people that are still sleeping in the, um, in the village. And we go through the channels towards uh, the nearest uh, lake that we can go in order to catch the sunrise uh, early in the morning. And um, while we're navigating, while we're sailing on through channels, people are start preparing the cameras and everything in order to uh, make them uh, ready for the, for the shooting. Sometimes uh, we, are very, we are going very, very slow, not in fast speed. Sometimes uh, when it's very cold in the morning, a lot of fog uh, is on the water. So the landscape is amazing. Imagine uh, that the whole lake is like this and you barely can see. And uh, after the sunrise, the fog is uh, rising up and disappear and you can have a very nice. Of course, those videos are not uh, taken on the same time. And I must tell you that it's not high quality video because they are made with, uh, with my iPhone. It's just notes. And uh, sometimes uh, if we are lucky, we can see also the moon. Uh, before the sunrise, so it's a it's a great uh, uh, show early in the morning, and look how the how the um, uh, picture can be done in the morning with the with the moon. And of course, we get lucky in one morning because as we arrive on the lake, no birds were on the lake, but. Uh, as the sun rises, uh, a flock of pelicans arrive and uh, uh, descend in, in, our, in front of us, just between us and the sun. And of course, we start making pictures. And it was an amazing light and we can make amazing pictures. And it was quite nice. It was such a, such a, a fortune for us to to have those pelicans coming from nowhere and uh, just landed uh, in front of us and start uh, playing on the water. Of course, not the, all the pictures are on the same, uh, some, same uh, time. There are different pictures from different times. And in the morning before uh, the sunrise, the pelican are very uh, quiet, they are just going around and um, after the sun uh, getting up in the sky, they start fishing. Also, you can see swans, the sunrise. The swans are uh, more shy than the pelicans. And as soon as you go closer to them, they are taking off and fly away. But uh, there is a different technique of uh, taking away uh, of uh, airborne. Uh, usually the, the swans are stepping on the water with the uh, alternative legs, um, uh, but the pelicans uh, hit the waters with the both le legs at a time. And in the morning, as the sun going up and up and we have more light, we start taking pictures, taking pictures of, on the small birds. We are waiting uh, to see what happens around us. And we have uh, this, um, I, I will tell you right now, what's the name of the bird. I'm not a bird specialist, but I identify my, um, Okay, okay, okay. 
It is common tern, the name of this bird, it's common tern. And it's a lot of noise while uh, they are fighting and quarreling uh, over the water in order to protect their nest or to, to, to fight for a better place to, to have, a, to build up a nest and something like this is a, a lot of noise, a lot of noise. I'm so sorry that you cannot uh, hear the, the sound. Not most of the sound are interesting, but this kind of sound of uh, these birds in the morning are very, very nice. And you see, of course, some frogs on the, on the vegetation that uh, float over the water. And you can see that camouflage uh, play a very important role in, uh, in nature. And this is, let me see, purple heron. Also, you barely can see it because it's, the camouflage is uh, hidden by the uh, colors of the of the plumage, uh, and uh, he dissimulate in, in into the background. You barely can see it. This is why I put this picture here, uh, because they are fishing, and uh, I barely see it with my tele lens. Of course, the first hours in the morning are very good. The light is amazing. Uh, and we start making the photography, we, we start making picture of uh, the, the, uh, the pelicans. What we see here, it's a great white pelican, which is uh, a protected uh, uh, species and it's on a conservation list. Uh, this um, bird has uh, like uh, until uh, 15 kilos weight and the wingspan goes to 3.6 meters, the largest, which is uh, a very large bird and a very big one. And uh, it's impressive to see uh, them, how they take off uh, early in the morning. And uh, it's a nice picture. Also, as I, as I told you, the swans are very shy. Uh, they are taking off very quickly as we going slowly, slowly to go um, closer and closer for a better photo. And they are taking off, but we, um, we take uh, advantage of uh, this amazing light in the morning. And you can see that the, under the wings, we have very warm light and over the wings, there is cold light that came from the sky. And this uh, makes this uh, morning light, very special. And here are the pelicans taking off. This is on, on channel. Uh, we are sailing uh, back home and uh, suddenly some other boats come from the different direction and they, they take off and just stay down on, on much further on, on the same channel. And we can make photos of them the pelican, uh, for myself, the pelican is the most uh, beautiful bird to, to be uh, photographed in the Danube Delta. And I'm uh, very in love with these uh, birds and taking a lot of picture of them. And it's, it's a very interesting trick that um, always the water birds take off against the wind. So if you want to take very nice photos, you just slowly, slowly moving towards the wind in order to see, see the pelican from uh, the front when they take off. This is a very important, uh, let's say, trick in order to make good photos of the pelicans. And uh, after a short uh, flight, they uh, go down to the water again and the like skiing, they, they put the legs in front of them in order to break the speed and um, stay on the water. Look at them, morning water and taking off. It's a very impressive moment. And as you see now, there is like, um, 
a lot of uh, a lot of uh, seagulls in the back of our uh, boat uh, looking for a small fish because our uh, propeller uh, is uh, very uh, goes our boat goes to the shallow waters so our propeller it's nearby the surface of the water and uh, sometimes uh, uh, the propeller hits small fish and uh, those uh, sea seagulls uh, are going to to fish to take the fish and eat them and this is what the picture you, you can make through into the flock of uh, this is, um, uh, let me see what the name of the black headed gull, but with the summer plumage, this kind of seagull. With a very long lens, uh, the dip of field is very narrow, but uh, with a very uh, good camera you can focus inside the inside the flock and follow a specific bird and you can uh, take pictures of these birds inside the flock as you see i follow the same bird as they fly through the over the water and uh, the camera always focuses on the same bird and then we moving forward to the through the channels in order to find more other birds in the in the Danube Delta because I must tell you that the Danube Delta it's a it's a UNESCO heritage site and it's a protected area. Uh, uh, fishing are allowed only for the locals and for the their basic needs. And here it is how the, the beautiful uh, delta looks like from above. And this is our boat going and sailing uh, through the channels in order to, to find more birds to, to take photos. Also, some people go kayaking through the delta in order to see birds, birds watching, bird watchers mainly. Uh, um, not many photographers, but a lot of bird watchers are going through the Danube Delta through the kayak in order to see and uh, catalog the birds. Here are some of them. Looking for birds with a, with a binocular. And once again, this is on the lake, on a very wide lake in the Danube Delta. Of course, if you have a, a drone like I have and I shoot with a drone, uh, I'm not uh, going over the birds, but stay away a little bit from the birds. And you can see like a channel of the swans. They are going uh, through certain channels to a shallow water to be more safe. And as I said to you, the taking off of the of this one are uh, it's, it's impressive. Also, they are also big birds. And what's interesting, because um, of the feather in the top of the wings, when they take off, they make a very interesting noise. Sometimes uh, they fly along uh, with our boat, then uh, we are able to take photography during the flight. We are going on the same speed with them. This is an overlapping of uh, three swans, and it's not uh, something like genetic <laughs> something. <laughs> and as you know, um, uh, uh, the the. The swans, how, I don't know how to say, uh, the small ones, after they uh, get out from the eggs, they, they are not white. The, 
I don't know how to how to name the a signet. Signet. Okay. Signet. I don't know in English. <laughs> in English. Okay. I don't know that word. They are, they are brown. They are brown. Uh, until one year, they uh, they are brown. So this is a uh, very interesting uh, transformation that uh, uh, this one happens through the ages, through the through their lives. They start being brown and then became white. And uh, this brown plumage is for camouflage, of course. They can see harder if they are like this. And uh, uh, the, the male that are guarding us in order to protect the, the small ones. And this is, let me see. What's the, the name of, of this? Uh, do you know the name of this? Uh, water lily. Water lily, yes, water lily. It's water lily. White water lily, they said. It is a, it's a very nice. And during the spring uh, until uh, autumn, all the Danube Dela Delta, it's filled with this kind of water lily, which are very interesting to, to, to shut in the morning hours. Some details of the water while we're sailing. And as I told, uh, told you, the, the, the landscape is very interesting in the Danube Delta. You can find very minimalistic landscape. And of course, during the mornings and during the evenings, People from the boat take uh, pictures of the landscape uh, or to the, to the birds. This is uh, leaves of the water lily. This is early in the, in the spring when the flowers do doesn't come up to the surface, but uh, the leaves come out, come out from the bottom. And in the evening, we uh, take a, a good position in order to make some uh, nice uh, waterscapes. And um, I must tell you that this, this bird, it's uh, common to the Europe and also to the Northern part of the uh, Africa and uh, in, the, in Asia. And uh, this common, uh, this white, great white pelican is uh, nesting in Romania during the summer, but during the winter time, they are going to the south, they, they are migrating on the shore of the Black Sea and then on the, on the Aegean Sea towards the Delta of the Nile. And then they spend the winter in uh, the Delta of the Nile and in the spring, like in the middle of uh, April, they are coming back until the mid of September and spend the time in uh, Danube Delta while they are nesting and making uh, uh, future generation of, of, uh, of them. There are special areas where uh, they are nesting. The, uh, the, the entrance in those areas are prohibited in order not to disturb them because um, if uh, somebody goes to a, a, a pelican nest and uh, disturb them, the pelican never come back to his nest and he will lose the eggs and also the, the, uh, the small ones uh, from this year. So the area are very well protected. And uh, by the way, uh, it's very, very difficult to reach that area, even for the scientist. Uh, it's a, it's a very difficult to go through because the water is very shallow and a, a lot of vegetation and so on. And this is another kind of pelican that uh, stays all the year round in the, in the Danube Delta. And another species that is very interesting is the great cormorant. Uh, we have two species like great cormorant and the small cormorant, which are uh, different by sizes, of course. 
And what is interesting that uh, they also live in colonies, but since they are not protected, you can visit the colony. Uh, we can stay uh, the distance in order not to disturb them, but anyway, they make a lot of noise when they see us. And sometimes uh, they uh, leave the, the nest and uh, uh, bird of prey come and uh, take their eggs. But it's not, not a, a, such a big deal about that because in two or three days, the cormorant uh, will uh, deploy another egg. So they are very prolific. They, during the year, they make like uh, two or three generation of uh, newcomers. So it's not a problem if you go nearby the, the colonies and take pictures. And because of their, uh, I don't know, the poop, it's very, uh, it's very acid. And uh, they destroy all the, the, the tree that they nested in. And the tree became like a, like a, with no, no leaves and nothing. Uh, well, I, what's interesting about uh, cormorant and um, pelicans that they fish all together because the cormorants are taking advantage of uh, uh, the pelicans. The pelicans are um, uh, uh, fishing uh, in shallow waters and they are gathering the, ba the, 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 fish, uh, the fish flocks in uh, very uh, narrow places and uh, they go uh, underwater with their heads and uh, eat the, the, take the, the, um, the fish. But uh, the, those fish that escape from the pelicans are fished by the, those uh, cormorants that in fact, they are, uh, swim under the water, they submerge the water and uh, fish under the water uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the food. This is very interesting. Always when you see a, a flock of pelican uh, uh, harvesting fish, you will see also a lot of, uh, of cormorant around and it's a lot of noise and a lot of uh, uh, movement around. Other interesting uh, uh, bird in a, in a big one, it's a black uh, white-tailed uh, eagle which is uh, the same like uh, bald eagle in the United States. It's a fisherman eagle. He fishes uh, uh, um, fresh fish. So it's, um, um, it's a big bird. It's uh, second largest after the pelican in uh, Danube Delta. Um, and here it is in flight. And when it's uh, old, you can see that they have a white tail. Since they are a uh, juvenile like this one, they don't have, uh, they have a plumage as a juvenile in this photo. And here it's an adult. And uh, sometimes the adult, as uh, he aged, uh, his head becoming more and more gray and come uh, uh, looking like a bald eagle, but it's not a bald eagle. Well, let me see this another another nice uh, another nice pelican. It's another nice bird. It's a um, uh, great egret. We have two species in Danube Delta, like a great egret. Egret and small egret. The great one has black legs. You can uh, make it, and, and it's larger than the small one, of course. And this is the black one, the, the big one. And here is a small egret, which is, has uh, yellow legs. And of course, uh, Eurasian spoonbill, spoonbill. It's a very interesting uh, bird. Uh, they are nesting only a few pairs in the uh, Danube Delta. So we are very lucky from time to time to meet them and uh, take photos of them. Uh, they eat 
uh, like small animals from shallow waters. This is why they have that flat, um, I don't know how to name it, the part, the front part of the- Beak. The bilk. Bilk? Beak. Beak, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not a good English speaker. You're a very good English speaker. <laughs> oh, so thank you. Okay, so, of course, the white stork fishing a frog. It's also common in, in uh, Danube Delta. And this one is Western Marsh Harrier. It's a harrier that you can find in, in Danube Delta. And this is the squacko heron. We name it yellow heron, but their English name is squacko heron. And in flight. And this one is European roller. It's a very nice colored uh, little bird. And also here is the purple heron in flight. It's a big, it's a big one. Uh, the wingspan has uh, almost one and a half meter. And it's very nice when he flies, you can see the whole colors of the plumage, which are very nice. And this is um, black crowned night heron. You see the eyes are very big and large in order to see during the night. They have a very good night vision and a kingfisher. It's a very, very small bird. And he flies amazing fast. You barely can see it. And this one is glossy ibis. Of course, we have some mammals, but they are not so often seen in, um, in Danube Delta. And this is uh, the golden jackal. It's hard to, to photograph uh, animals in Delta, Danube Delta. And um, after the storm, a panoramic view of a lake. Okay, this is what I want to tell you about the Danube Delta. The next part will be about uh, wildlife in other parts of uh, Romania. If you have some question, please ask. Um, I have a few gathered. Um, so the first one was from uh, Janie. What, wildlife, uh, what changes have you seen in the wildlife in the Delta in the past 10 years or so? Uh, sorry, once again, I didn't understand. What changes have you seen in the wildlife in the Delta in the past 10 years or so? Well, not many. Not many. People said that uh, the climate change it will affect, but I didn't see many changes in the Danube Delta in bird activity or in wildlife activity. The only thing that is quite... Um, uh, interesting is that the number of fish are less and less in the Danube Delta. I don't know why, what's happened, not because of the intense fishing, but uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, the science uh, uh, people are looking for this, um, this change, but they don't have an answer yet. Um, another one, how early in the morning do you need to go out to get your photos? We uh, start in the morning when it's dark outside, uh, like uh, one hour before the sunrise. And we gather to, uh, the boat and we leave and we sail like 30 to 40 minutes to the nearest lake. And then we, uh, we have to arrive like uh, 15 minutes before the sunrise in order to find a good place. We spotted the lake with the with the binoculars in order to see what what we what we can photograph, 
where are the birds if we can find some birds sometimes we can find no birds and we change the lake and so on since they are wild animals we cannot uh, know where the the birds are in the morning <laughs> so it's a uh, sometimes we don't find anything <laughs> yeah sometimes um, Cameron asks um, out of interest what equipment do you have in your camera bag what what equipment do you have in your camera bag when you go out what lens yeah well I I, I shoot with a with a Nikon I'm a Nikon guy I shoot with uh, uh, for birds with wide uh, like 600 uh, uh, lens and 300 lens and 70 to 200 lens. I have uh, all three with me on two different bodies in order to be very quick in the morning, not to change lenses and so on. This is how I work. And then Roger asks, when is the best time to see the most birds? Well, uh, the most, uh, uh, the best time for shooting is in the spring, during uh, late uh, April and the uh, first part of May, and in the autumn, uh, at the beginning of September, mainly, until uh, the, the pelican are gone. Uh, the pelican are leaving uh, Delta starting the mid-September until the, the end of September. They start leaving, not all, all together, but like this. Uh, that's all the questions we have just now, so you're good to move on. Ah, no other questions? Not just now, so if anybody okay. has any, just keep putting them in chat. Okay, I will uh, go on and uh, tell you uh, something uh, in short about uh, the wildlife that we, we can find in Romania. Okay, uh, Romania is uh, known as uh, the largest number of wildlife uh, in uh, Europe, except Russia, of course. Uh, but um, otherwise, it's the largest uh, population of, uh, of bears, of uh, Ursus arctos, which is the brown bear. Uh, the brown bear is also found in the, uh, in the United States and in Alaska but they name it grizzly. And they're much larger because in, in Alaska, uh, they feed with, uh, with the salmon, which is more uh, protein uh, rich uh, food, and they grow much larger than the, uh, our bears. But even so, I saw also in Denali Park, uh, uh, grizzly that are the same size uh, like our our brown bear in the wilderness. Uh, usually we have um, uh, like 5,000 uh, bears in the wilderness of Romania. But it's a huge debate right now uh, about, uh, uh, because, um, about uh, brown bears because in um, the, the, the hunting of the brown bears were shut down five years ago but right now it seems that the population has grows a lot and we experience a lot of uh, bear meeting nearby the mountain villages or even my town I, when i walk my dog in the forest i live uh, just uh, uh, nearby the forest and i walk my dog through the forest and i meet several times with, with a mother bear with two small cubs and uh, I must tell you that they are not uh, uh, dangerous as soon as you are not close to them. Usually they avoid the humans and run in the forest, but if you are too close, maybe it's dangerous. So, but since uh, there is a lot of population of bears, uh, another um, uh, way of uh, doing wildlife is photographing bears. I must tell you that uh, it's very dangerous to go in the, into the wilderness and just photograph bears and wait for them. You could do this, but you, know to, you have to know the habits of the bears, where they are come, going through, what are the feeding place and so on. Another way that you can uh, shoot bears in the, there are a series of uh, hides special built for uh, photographing uh, uh, wildlife, mainly birds, mainly bears. And 
I make uh, tours in such uh, hides uh, in order to take photography of, of the birds, of the birds, of the bears. Here are uh, in the rain a, a, a bear. And sometimes they are coming like mother and two cubs to their cubs, two years old cubs. And in the middle are the mother and both side the bear, the cubs. And you can see the mother is on the left and uh, one cub is in two legs and the other one is eating. So in order to, to take the bears nearby you, uh, the rangers of the park put a small amount of corn into the grass in order to attract them and to, in order to see them uh, from time to time. You know, bear, it's a very curious animal and they, if they know that have even a few uh, pieces of corn uh, in, a, in a place, they are going there to eat them. So they are very curious and they are coming uh, to eat even a small amount of, of food in order to, to be satisfied. And this is not a real fight. This is a fight just for uh, here, he in, a, in, a, in an area. And, you know, like Baloo, <laughs> against the against a tree. And sometimes they are very funny, playing around, running. When a, a bigger one is coming, the, the youngster are running away from him. And sometimes they, they're very, very, very funny, playing around. But, and you can uh, shoot also this kind of photo with the bear and the fox. The problem is that uh, this is a big bear, a very big bear. And um, since there are a small amount of corn in the grass, of course, there are some uh, mouses that are coming to eat and the fox appeared to eat the mouse. <laughs> and this is the moment. And also wild boars are coming in the same spot. Also in Romania, it's a big program on, of reintroduction, the European bison, which is was disappeared 200 years ago in Romania. And now all over the Europe, it's a European program that uh, reintroduce uh, the European bison in the wilderness. In Romania, we already have, have like 100 uh, um, uh, animals in the wilderness already and uh, uh, like 50 more uh, for acclimatization in special places. Uh, they are not, uh, uh, violent anymore. They are very kind animal. You can go pretty close to take photos of them, but not so close. This is uh, here. I use also like a 300 millimeters lens, so I'm like 50 meters away from him. Here I'm closer, and here. I stay behind the tree just to protect myself. Okay, we ended with uh, the chapter with the wildlife in Romania. So if you have any questions about wildlife. Yep, we've got a few. Um, Roger asks, what animal would you like to photograph that you have not yet succeeded in capturing? Well, it's uh, difficult. We, we have a, a great variety of wildlife in Romania. There is also the lynx, which is very, very difficult to take photos. Wolves are also very difficult to take photos. Uh, uh, they are 
very shy animals. They are hunting only during the dusk or dawn and during the night or in very remote areas. And there are also big like uh, uh, elk, not elk, um, uh, um, I don't know what's the name of, a big, a big animal with a herbivore with a big horns. I don't know how to name it in English. And uh, there, there are a lot of animals in Romania, but I'm attracted uh, with the bears a lot with the bears. Bears are my passion in uh, wildlife photography. Yep. Um, Cameron asks, have you ever found yourself in a tricky situation when you've been out shooting bears and how have you dealt with it? Not shooting bears. I have been in a very tricky situation, but uh, in other, uh, not while I'm shooting uh, bears, because I, I told you I uh, shoot bears in, in uh, special places. But as I go through the mountains, I meet with bears and it was some tricky situation, yes. We sometimes we, we are very close. They, they stand up with two legs and try to frighten me and I just go, uh, go back and leave him alone. And I meet uh, the bear with my dog and uh, the, the bear was very angry with my dog and we have to go back <laughs> very quickly but not running never running uh, on a bear because uh, it uh, came after you um, Ian asks what is the relationship between the villagers and the bears around the area about uh, between the the villagers and the bears the villagers and the well it's a, it's a hard situation right now because uh, more and more bears come down to the villages and uh, uh, during the, the autumn, they, they destroy the crop. They, uh, you know, the corn, they go to the corn and eat the corn or uh, sometimes, uh, the, I don't know, they, they go to eat the, the apple from the tree or some other fruits. And there, there is a very tough situation right now because uh, uh, I think the population of bears are very large right now in Romania. And the young ones uh, uh, have no space in the wilderness and they are coming uh, to eat uh, nearby the villages, nearby the towns and pushed back by the old ones. You know, the bear are territorial animal. And since there is a territory uh, uh, run by an old bear, the, the young one cannot uh, stay in the, same, uh, in the same spot and they, they uh, travel in order to find other areas. But uh, since there are a lot of them, uh, they try to find uh, food nearby the villages, nearby the human places. And then, um, oh no, there's two more, three more now. <laughs> um, are there bears near the, the Danube Delta? No, there are no bears. Bears are only in the mountains, only in the mountain area. Uh, I don't think the bears were a, ever seen in the Danube Delta. Mm -hmm. In the Danube Delta, you can see also wild boar sometimes. Um, Ian again asks, which part of Romania has the most bears? Well, uh, the mountains. The mountains are... Uh, in, in this area, the mountains are like, like uh, these are the, the part of Romania with the mountains and here are other mountains. I have seen but, one in Maramuresh. In Maramuresh, yes. Mm. yes. Sometimes you, you can see in Maramuresh bears in the mountain area. And then uh, Zef asks, have you ever filmed the bears? If not, would you want to? as opposed to taking photos, filmed them as opposed to taking photos of them. I don't understand, sorry. Like, have you filmed them, like, have you taken videos of them as opposed to... Uh, yes, I take videos of you... them, but also in a very, uh, very special situation in a hide. I, I go with a, with a camera in a hide and then uh, wait for them in a special place and film them. Yes, I, um, I send you a link with, uh, with um, ecotourism. Uh, it's a... Um, 
uh, short um, series about uh, ecotourism in Romania that I made last years. And in one uh, part of Romania, there are a lot of bears and I uh, filmed them. Yep, uh, that's all the questions we have for just now. So you're good to move on. Okay, let's go further and uh, talk about um, the northern, northern part of Romania, which is very interesting. This northern part is made from Maramures and Bukovina. Those areas uh, are very nice because they are still have uh, villages that preserve the old tradition more than in other part of the country. So it's a very nice area for photographers to go through and uh, to take a uh, photography of um, uh, for rural uh, country uh, countryside and also um, in the Bukovina you can find like painted monasteries very very interesting painted monasteries but let's go through and um, this is uh, an early morning in uh, Maramuresh what is interesting in Maramuresh that they uh, it was a, a, a civilization built on wood Everything was made in Maramuresh was made from wood. And they are famous about, for their churches, like, like this one, this uh, shape of church is very interesting. And uh, some of them are UNESCO heritage sites. And um, uh, they're quite amazing. Uh, some of the, of the towers are very, very, very high. And uh, Thing that this church was built like uh, 300 years ago. And they are very old, uh, nice churches. And this is in Bukovina, the other part of the uh, northern uh, region of uh, Romania, Bukovina and Maramures. And during the autumn, you know, if you stay on a on a high hill, you can find a very nice uh, fog in the valleys. So it's very nice to, to stay at the sunrise on, a, on top of a hill. And this is what, how they, they, they um, harvest the, the hay. And they uh, dry the hay on these, these fences. And then they uh, put in the, these cabins during the winter in order to have growing animals, uh, uh, livestock, it's uh, very important in this region. You can see sheep over here. And uh, in this part of the country, it's also very important. The religion is very important. People are very attached to the religion tradition and so on. And as you can see, uh, they are going uh, to the church every Sunday at the, the Mesa. And there is a very nice moment when you can take pictures. Early in the morning, the first lady that came to the church, long time before the Mesa starts, in order to be alone and it wasn't alone, it was also myself in the church, waiting for the, for the Mesa. And the people you, you see during the, during the Sundays, they wear traditional clothes. And this is normal. Every Sunday you can find people that take the traditional clothes and go to the church. During the, during the week, they are not wearing so much uh, traditional ones, but during the, the, during the Sunday, they always. And here is the inside of an Orthodox church, which is painted mainly in, uh, in Bukovina. The church is painted also outside, like this one. And this church is a UNESCO heritage site. You can see that the paintings are outside the church and inside the church. And sometimes in Bukovina, the church are like small fortified uh, castle. This is a monastery, not only the church. And also in Maramures, uh, people still live 
in houses made of wood and uh, they, they put against the wood, they put clay and they paint it uh, in blue and cover the, the houses with, uh, with hay. And this is a very ecological house. You should tell them what the pans mean. Uh, this, no, it's not that meaning that, I suppose you, you visit Romania. I read about you, Jan, and um, well, people said that uh, those, uh, those pots put, put like this in the outside the means that they have a daughter for a, a marriage. But this is not true. <laughs> this is just a story. Uh, usually, they put it outside uh, during the summer because after they wash them, they, they put to dry. And in the same time, I must tell you that up in the mountains, there is a lot of UV radiation which sterilizes them. It's, just, it's, a, it's a fact that they, they didn't know why, but they use it. And uh, 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 on the shepherd house up in the mountains, they do like this and they sterilize it uh, by uh, putting it in the direct sunlight and the UV rays are sterilizing uh, uh, the pots. So this is a real mean, meaning. The other one, it's just a story, a nice story to be sell mainly to the tourists. <laughs> And it's very nice. I, uh, there is a family that live in this house. It's a very nice family. And always when I go to Maramures, I visit them and take a, take a tour in, in their house. It's, it's a very nice house. And this is um, uh, how the, the, the people, the villagers are preserving the, the meat and the sausages and the lard during, for the winter time. They put it in the attic over the animal stable and uh, uh, smoke them and uh, dry them in the spot. And then uh, they keep it all over the winter in the same spot. And uh, during the evening, they go up and take a piece for the dinner or for the lunch for the next day. And this is a stable, animal stable. And of, of course, since there is a lot of animal blacksmiths are common in the region. And their tools, ancient tools. Uh, this blacksmith is uh, like a fifth generation of blacksmith in the village. And of course, during the winter time, they keep the, the hay in um, cabins, uh, around the, the villages and they use sledge to carry them. And here is a villager that go the, with an empty sledge. And uh, there is like a, like a tool to maneuver the, the, the hay in order to take the hay home for the, for the livestock. People still use oxes in order to work in the, in the forest during the winter time. And here's a traditional way to cut a tree. And carpenters are very common in this area. And they build this kind of instrument. I don't know, horns. I don't know if you have an English name for this. And they sing very nice and they communicate from one hill to another with these horns. And they sing, of course, on them. And as I told you, timber, it's very important. And here is uh, the last European narrow gauge steam train that's still carrying down on the valley the, the logs for. Um, for making timber. And this is also a, a touristic train, but what is interesting that it's still 
an industrial train and a touristic train in the same time. And I do organize like tours in uh, this part of the country in order to take pictures of trains, of this kind of trains. It's such a one full day just shooting trains. Who is interested in about trains? When I was young, when I was a child, when people ask me, what do you want to make when you grow up? I always said that steam train machine driver. <laughs> And since then, I, I, I really like train training. And this is a very nice area. And of course, childhood with sledge on the hills. OK, if you have any questions about this part of the country, Mara Muresh and Bukovina, please. It just makes me want to go back. <laughs> Well, you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> COVID <Yeah>. stops me. <laughs> <laughs> no, if you have a EU passport, you're free to, to come. <laughs> um, are the younger people keeping up the traditions? Yeah, more and more young people in this area start to keep uh, the tradition and organize them th themselves for uh, uh, important um, for important uh, holidays, religious holidays, and so on. During during the during the Christmas, it's a very interesting period of time to make photos in uh, Maramuresh and Bukovina, and also in summer during Saint Mary's uh, holiday. It was in 15th of August. It's a, a lot of procession and. Uh, pilgrimage and uh, very interesting in Maramuresh mainly. Yeah, and um, that's all the questions that we have just now. So you're again, good to keep going. Okay, okay. I keep um, going and presenting a little bit of uh, Transylvania, which is this area in the middle of the country inside the mountain range. Since the mountain range goes like this, this part of the country is inside the mountains and the um, in uh, this part of the country, it's an e ethnical mixture between uh, the Saxon, the Hungarians, and Romanians. And that mixture enriched a lot our culture and our uh, heritage. And what you can see in the southern part of Transylvania, uh, there is a Saxon heritage. And in the middle of Transylvania and, the, the, and Eastern Transylvania, it's the Hungarian heritage and Romanian heritage all over the places. So let's start moving. This is uh, um, during the Middle Age when uh, the Saxon came in the uh, southern part of the Transylvania in order to guard the border of, uh, and at that time, Transylvania was a part of the Hungarian uh, state monarchy and the king uh, of uh, Hungary uh, bring the, the, the um, Saxon in the southern part and the eastern part of uh, Transylvania in order to guard the borders. And also, since they are very good craftsmen, they need uh, like a lot of craftsmen and uh, uh, they have a, a lot of uh, freedom. They were free people and they're organized in villages and towns. My own town, Brasov, it's a German town. It's a Saxon town. And they start uh, building uh, uh, their typical uh, villages and uh, they start building uh, churches. And uh, furthermore, they uh, start uh, uh, defense the churches with walls and uh, start uh, making uh, fortified churches uh, and each village has a fortified churches that was able to um, hide the, all the population of the village during the war time or some, uh, I don't know, thieves invasion or something like this. And they can stay for months inside because they have livestock, they have water, they have food and everything inside the walls. And this is one of the biggest um, fortified church you can see. It, they have uh, like three round, uh, three walls around. 
the church. It is the biggest one. It's, the name is Biertan. And in, in the middle of Transylvania. In a different moment, the same, the same church. And you can see how the, the villages organized, the Saxon villages organized. Another, another village, another fortified church. Usually they put the church on the top of a hill in order to be more easy to defend. And one of the most important, it's the, the white church in the middle of Transylvania where the Prince Charles has several properties. And the name of the village is Viscri. And you can see some inside architecture of this kind of churches. They have organ, they have gothical style architecture. And this is a Hungarian village, also in uh, Transylvania. There is a big pool in the middle of the village where women uh, wash the carpet and the big cloth. And also during the winter time. A detail of a house. But also Transylvania is known by the people that still have livestock, mainly, mainly sheep. The shepherds, uh, there are still several family of shepherds that still made transhumance. Transhumance means that they live during the summer up in the mountain uh, while uh, the sheep are grazing uh, the pasture with uh, wild flowers and so on. They, and they make cheese, good quality cheese. And when the grazing is stopped, they move um, in the in the autumn, in late autumn. They descend from the mountain and go to the lower area to spend the winter time. And uh, I know a family uh, that make still make the transhumans, and I go alongside with them in order to photograph and uh, take pictures of their of their life and um, uh, start um, shooting film for a. Uh, a very big project about uh, transhumans in Europe. And early in the morning, the, the first milking is early at four, four and a half in the morning. It's still dark. This picture was made was almost dark. It's a long time exposure uh, from the tripod and uh, the ships are moving towards the milking place, mil milking spot. And here the shepherd, you, you see the little, the little daughter is so tired that she fall asleep. She uh, wake up early in the morning at four o'clock and the half past four, they start milking the ships. And she's so tired because she wake up in the morning. So early that she fell asleep. And this is the father, the mother, and they have four children, three daughters and one son. And the two, the three daughters, which are elders, working uh, during the summer holiday up in the mountains, helping their parents to make the cheese. And here is the cheese. Well, uh, uh, usually when I take uh, people that are not used to eat such kind of cheese, we name it telemia. It has a very strong taste, very, very strong taste. People are sometimes are, cannot eat them, <laughs> eat it. <laughs> but it's very tasty for me. It's the best cheese I ever eat. And of course, the shepherd house, the food is organic and amazing, amazing good. And here's a guy, the shepherd. And uh, a multitasking old lady, you know, she's knitting a sock. He talked with us, carrying uh, hay in the, 
and <laughs> she's a very funny lady. And that's it about uh, Transylvania, if you want to ask me something. It's a very brief story about Transylvania. Um, Ian just asked, will the Transhumans be a book? Will be a film, but it's a long-term project. Maybe we can finish, we start filming last, we start filming last year, the first footage, and maybe we will finish next year. And Where then, do you go? What countries do you go to? Uh, and also, we are um, the, the problem of the film will be besides the uh, transhumans, will be how the people are using the, the um, uh, how do you name it? The wool, the shared wool of the wool of the, of the ship after they share it how they use it. Most of the, sh of the wool is burned or put under the, under the earth in order to uh, decompose. But um, there, is a, there is a very, very, um, very good material for insulation, for uh, making compost uh, and everything. And um, there is a film about uh, this alongside with trans ones, the, uh, the wool process and we film in Italy, maybe in Wales also, uh, in uh, Germany, in uh, Norway. Uh, I think there are 12 countries where we're filming inside. It's a, it's a big project. Um, we've just got uh, just under 10 minutes left if you want to. Uh, continue with your presentation? Yes, and I will continue with um, uh, several images about my town. Brasov is my town and uh, the region which is very, very nice around the uh, Brasov. Here is my town uh, in the evening. It's a German town. It was uh, built at the beginning of 12th century. And it was uh, a very powerful trade center in Transylvania. It was, was uh, the most uh, wealthy town in uh, Transylvania during the Middle Age because they made a lot of, uh, a lot of um, arms, well, all kinds of arms, starting firearms, traditional arms and so on. They were a very good craftsman, and everybody by arms from Brasov. And uh, there is a hill nearby the city, like 1,000 meters high. There is a cable car. You can go up and uh, see a nice panorama. You can see this is a cable car. And this is the old town, which, which is mostly preserved as, as it was. This was the old medieval town. And we have here one of the biggest churches in the south uh, southwest uh, Europe. Here it is a black church in the middle of the town. This is the the town hall of the ancient city and the black church. And around Brasov, there are several uh, citadels. Uh, the more renowned Brand Castle, but everybody knows about Brand Castle, which is, uh, as legend said, that is Dracula Castle, but it isn't, of course. It's just a legend, but and uh, this is another citadel nearby the Brasov, and you can see the the landscape around Brasov. It's amazing, nice. We have rolling hills and mountains nearby the Brasov. Rolling hills uh, on the foot of the mountains, and then the big mountains are around. This name, uh, this area is uh, 
known by the Bran region with several villages where we met with uh, Jaini was Mugura and there are some other villages. And the, those are the rolling hills and above we can see the mountains. Small houses uh, uh, spotted uh, through the hills. They keep the hay during the, the, the winter time and sometimes they keep, keep also a livestock because they don't have enough space down in the valley. They keep the livestock up in the hills. And those are the small uh, cabins where they keep the livestock. And of course, there are, there are still some activities during the winter time like logging, And it's one of the most beautiful area for uh, landscape photography. One of the most renowned in Romania. And you can see why. And those are the mountains. Early in the morning. We live, uh, we start going uh, early in the morning at four o'clock. The sun was rising at 10 to 8, and for two and a half hour we walk in the night to reach that spot in order to make a photography. Life of a landscape photographer is hard. You have to walk a lot in, during the mornings or late in the evenings. It's a altitude hut in the Bucej mountains. And this is the highest hut in the Romanian mountains. It's 2,500 meters high. And that's it. That's my presentation. It takes one and a half hour, a lot. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Mikhail. That was Great. wonderful. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm wondering, are there still a couple of questions in there, um, Megan, for Mikhail? Or any more um, questions, just pop them in chat. Yeah, if there's any more questions, put them in. Um, there was your question, Janie. Um, can you tell us a bit about the work you do for the Equal Tourism Romania? Well, uh, for the I'm a I'm a part of an organization of ecotourism in Romania, and we have a uh, uh, developing uh, some uh, eco destination in Romania, like seven eco destination in Romania, and each destination is. Uh, around um, a natural reserve or a national park or something like this. And um, around uh, this uh, natural reserve, uh, there is some tradition, some villages that have a solid and good tradition and so on. And uh, we want to uh, encourage the, the, the locals to build up uh, pension houses in order to uh, receive guests uh, to um, enjoy the life, the real life, uh, yeah, as it was in the past. And uh, to preserve nature, to preserve uh, uh, tradition, to preserve architecture. This is how ecotourism uh, goes. And uh, uh, since I'm part of this organization, like uh, 15 years ago, and uh, we meet with Jenny in a, in a passion house that is part of this uh, organization in Magura. And uh, <clears throat> I made uh, some film for my organization uh, with a project, with an um, uh, American project, with American funds. We make a film about each eco destination from Romania. And there is a link that you will, uh, can access uh, uh, for this, uh, to see the, the, the film I have made uh, two years ago. Yeah, the links yeah, are dropped into chat. Thank you, Megan. So if you want to save the chat, everyone, um, there's three little dots 
just to the right of the empty chat box. If you click on that, you get the opportunity to save chat and all the links, including the Eco Romania film series and all of the links to connect you with Mikhail, including his Instagram uh, website um, are all in there as well. Um, any final questions for Mikhail tonight? Um, there was one from Zeth again. Um, what are the threats of the ecotourism projects are fighting against? Cases. Sorry? Um, what are the threats the ecotourism projects are fighting against? Well, I don't think there are threats, but um, people are not so easy to convince that ecotourism will be the future. We know that ecotourism could be a part of the tourism of the future tourism, not all the tourism, of course, but the quality tourism will be always ecotourism and um, uh, people uh, at the beginning are not so impressed about the idea but uh, there are several examples through the country that succeed in order to transform their villages and their destination in a very successful ones and uh, we are making we are showing them the experience of those villages and those uh, um, I don't know, actions, and uh, more and more people are interested in, the, in, in uh, developing uh, ecotourism. Um, uh, very popular right now, there are branches, uh, ecotourism branches, like uh, uh, one uh, village gather all the, I don't know, I don't know, all the cultural and uh, tourism and the cooking resources and put together, let's say, in a in the yard of a fortified church and you can go there and eat local uh, food very very tasty local food you can see uh, craftsmen from the local villagers you can take a bike tour or horse ride around and uh, to know the place to know the uh, surroundings to know the history of the of the place of the i don't know the fortified church or something like this and it develops, but slowly and slowly. Right. I think that's all the questions that we have for now. So, some lovely comments in the chat, Mihai. So, we'll save those and send them to you. Um, one or two people are reminiscing about trips Roger had visited in 2017, and it's brought back many happy memories, and he's, he's keen to return. And of course, Ian, who, 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 who spoke a couple of times, uh, is a great fan of uh, Romania and has published himself some books on, on Romania. So, um, yeah, lots of interest uh, from the group tonight. And uh, I think a number of people are probably quite tempted to visit you in Romania, Mihai. So thank you very much. That was a fascinating um, presentation and certainly it's pulled at my heartstrings. And I can't wait to get back and visit you again in, in Brasov, Mihai. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you are one of the most uh, impressed uh, person in this <laughs> meeting <laughs> because you, are, you live uh, such a long time in Romania and you start to know it uh, much more. Uh, here is my dog. He's very... <laughs> He's welcome. <laughs> He's welcome. Mikhail, thank you very much indeed. And if I can just remind everyone, if they want to save the chat, they just hover over those three dots and download it. You'll get all of Mikhail's links. And we're also recording tonight's uh, talk. So we will be, uh, with the help of um, one of our team, Zef, we will be editing it and uploading it to our YouTube channel uh, in the course of the next week or so. Um, so you can watch it again. And uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming along tonight. It's been an absolute delight having Mikhail with us. Thank you very much indeed. Mm -hmm.